Hello and welcome to Embryogenesis Week 3. And the most important characteristic features that occur in this week are number one, gastrulation, which is essentially the formation of the primitive streak and the arising of the intraembryonic mesoderm, because of which you have three germ layers, ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm, and the disc is now known as the trilaminar germ disc. Okay? The next thing that happens is the arising of a structure that apparently appears to disappear but when it does so it does establish the central axis of the body and helps in the development of the axial skeleton something that is known as induction of the axial skeleton now i don't want you to get too much in the detail of what induction means it is more of a molecular embryology term but what it necessarily means in layman words is stimulating the things around you to develop into something. And this happens by molecular signaling. It is also known as molecular cross talk. So most of the embryogenesis occurs because of these molecular signaling, which essentially turn on and turn off certain genes. And that is how organogenesis is formed. The third thing is a slight invagination from the endoderm into the connective stalk. Now I hope you know what the connective stalk is. It is the only part of the extra embryonic mesoderm where the silomic cavity has not really invaded. So it remains as a stalk that connects the caudal end of the bilaminar germ disc, now trilaminar, to the trophoblast which is going to form the future placenta. Okay. So, before we even start week 3, however, a quick look at week 2. So, by the end of day 14, now I'm going to ignore the trophoblastic aspect, but you know that it is divided into syn cytotrophoblast and cytotrophoblast, which further evolves into primary, secondary, tertiary, chorionic villi, and then the placenta. What you see in red here is the extraembryonic mesoderm. What you see encroaching everywhere is the extraembryonic coelom, also known as the chorionic cavity. And that has not completely gone in this region. So this region becomes the connecting stock, okay? Which, as you can see, contains extra embryonic mesoderm that is dark red in color. Then we also have the bilaminar germ disc. Everyone knows that this is the epiblast. This is the hypoblast, okay? This is the amniotic cavity, right? And this is the secondary yolk sac or the definitive yolk sac that's already labeled, right? And it used to be bigger, but then a part of it is extruded out as the exosilomic cyst. So you've got a smaller version that is basically surrounded by the cells of the hypoblast. Okay, all good till here. So let's move on and see what happens. On day 15, arises what is known as the primitive streak and this leads to gastrulation or formation of the three germ layers. Now what exactly is the primitive streak? It's essentially a groove that is formed on one end of the bilaminar germ disc which essentially is going to be the caudal end and it is accompanied by two bulgings on either side as you can see here. So together this entire structure is known as the primitive streak. The bulging on either side with the groove in between. This occurs at day 15 as I already mentioned. Day 15 or day 16. And what exactly is happening underneath because of which the bulge is formed. Is that the cells of the epiblast in this region have suddenly lost attachment with each other. Because of down regulation of a certain system that you don't need to know about, molecular signals, etc, etc. But the down regulation of those will lead to de-attachment. So they lose their adhesion to each other and start dipping inside in the direction shown by the arrows. And this process is known as invagination. Okay. Oops, sorry. Invagination. What is invagination? It is the dipping inside of the cells of the epiblast as you can see by the direction of the arrows because they have lost their adhesion or adherence to each other and these cells now start traveling all around firstly they are going to replace the hypoblast and these new cells are now known as endoderms so where is the endoderm derived from the epiblast 
Okay, you remember this. Now, these same cells also start going from a caudal to a cranial direction, which will be seen in the next diagram. Okay, so once they completely replace the hypoblast by the endoderm, then what remains in between and what keeps on traveling from the caudocranial direction, from the caudal end to the cranial end, is the intraembryonic mesoderm. Okay, now we are going to use the word intraembryonic mesoderm to differentiate it from the extraembryonic mesoderm. And finally, whatever cells stay on top, these are now known as the ectoderm. So there you go. You've got the three layers, endoderm, the mesoderm, to be more precise, intraembryonic mesoderm, and the ectoderm. So these are the three germ layers of the trilaminar germ disc. And as we study organogenesis, eventually we'll realize which layer gives rise to which kind of structures, etc., etc. Okay? Now, what you see here is the change in the shape of the embryo as it goes from day 15 to day 18. So you can see that it has become more slipper shaped. You can see the primitive streak arising in this area, but you can see the change in the structure. Now I want to direct you towards this little circular thing that is formed at the cranial most end of the primitive streak. And that is known as the primitive node. What is the primitive node? It is also known as the primary inducer. Now I've already told you what induction means. So this is one of the most important primary inducers which has a very important role in the formation, especially of the forebrain region. Okay? So just remember that. What is the primitive node? It is also known as Hensen's node, based on the scientist who came up with it. Hensen's node, which is a primary inducer and it is playing a very important role in induction of the forebrain. Don't worry about these things, okay? Just remember them for now. So this primitive node has a small pit inside it which is known as the primitive pit. Okay, so the cranial most end of the primitive streak has a primitive node also known as Henson's node and there is a pit that forms inside it which is known as the primitive or Henson's pit. Okay, a little more on that in the next slide. Here you can see the migration of the intraembryonic mesoderm while it is forming in the primitive streak and going from a cordocranial direction. Do you get that? Cordocranial direction. That's important. Now, as this is migrating, there are two regions in which the intraembryonic mesoderm does not really end up accumulating. That one region towards the cranial end is known as the oropharyngeal membrane. And the one end at the caudal region is known as the cloacal membrane. Okay, just remember, both these regions, the oropharyngeal membrane and cloacal membrane show the ectoderm firmly adherent to the endoderm with absolutely no invagination from the intraembryonic mesoderm. Do I make myself clear? Great. Now the region just caudal to the oropharyngeal membrane is known as the Procordal plate. What is it known as the procordal plate or the precordal plate? And what is that region? That is the region beyond which the notochord does not progress further cranially. That is the region beyond which the developing notochord does not progress further cranially. And that brings me to my next slide the notochord. Okay? Before that, I just want you to understand one very important thing that this intraembryonic mesoderm that is migrating everywhere is arranged in a certain format. Okay, so the intraembryonic mesoderm that goes straight cranially from the primitive pit, remember the primitive pit and the primitive node that goes straight cranially from here forms what is known as the notochord. Okay. That's the end for notochord. Okay? The intraembryonic mesoderm dying just lateral to this notochord, seen in light blue over here, is known as the paraxial mesoderm. As the name suggests, paraaxis. Axis ke either side ko. Hai na? Paraaxial intraembryonic mesoderm. Then lying 
even laterally to that that you can see over here in purple is known as the intermediate mesoderm what is it known as the intermediate mesoderm don't forget to add intraembryonic as a prefix everywhere and finally in green you have what is known as the lateral plate mesoderm okay lateral plate intraembryonic mesoderm and the yellow strip that you see is just the intraembryonic mesoderm communicating with the extra embryonic mesoderm that lies all around in this area okay that is the extra embryonic mesoderm okay so in this figure you can see the oropharyngeal membrane and the cloacal membrane where the intraembryonic mesoderm cannot really get through but you can see the migration of all the other different intraembryonic mesoderms and how they are classified into paraxial intermediate and lateral plate now what all do they contribute to we'll speak at another lecture but just remember these are the three important classifications of the intraembryonic mesoderm okay and i hope that you understand the orientation of this slide okay you are literally hanging on the roof of the amniotic cavity and looking down at the ectoderm and then that ectoderm is removed so what you see is the mesoderm understood so underneath this mesoderm in this area you are going to have the endoderm the ectoderm has been lifted off like you would lift a loaf of bread from a sandwich you can imagine this to be the chutney that is spreading okay you can imagine this as the chutney that is spreading all around on the lower loaf of bread so the lower loaf of bread is the endoderm the chutney is the invaginating intraembryonic mesoderm and on top of that there was a bread that is removed which was the ectoderm and if you look at this diagram here of 19 days the bread has not been removed so what you see over here is a part of the bread that assumes a different shape and that is known as the neural plate we are going to visit the neural plate when we study the development of the central nervous system okay the neural plate also known as the neuroectoderm gives rise to the entire central nervous system okay you can see again the primitive node here cranial most part of the primitive streak right and you can see the primitive streak over here underneath this you're going to have your endoderm all this is invaginating intraembryonic mesoderm okay so let's talk about this fellow the part of the intraembryonic mesoderm that goes exactly along the central axis from the primitive node towards the procordial plate that is the notochord now you can see that this is a different section this is the cranial end this is the caudal end you can see the connecting stalk over here and this is the primitive streak this is the primitive pit okay you're seeing from the lateral view now before you were seeing from above hung on the roof of the amniotic cavity now you're seeing laterally so this is your amniotic cavity these are your amniogenic cells okay this light blue is the ectoderm the yellow is the endoderm and what you see in dark black is essentially the primitive streak cells that are going straight along the midline towards the procordial plate now this is the procordial plate or the oropharyngeal membrane okay this region you can see that the blue and the yellow is nicely firmly attached to each other correct and all these black things that are going along the midline is essentially the notochord so if i were to draw the same things in a slipper shaped embryo forgive my horrible drawing because it's a finger then you've got the procordial plate here you've got the primitive node and pit here and this is the primitive streak so you've got in the midline cells migrating like that and eventually they stop near the procordial plate region so this is your notochordal cells okay what are these the notochordal cells you can also call it the notochordal process remember it is sandwiched between the ectoderm and the endoderm correct so what happens is eventually there is a hole in this primitive pit and it extends throughout the entire notochordal process so if i take a transverse section of the notochord if it was like a notochordal solid process first later what happens is a lumen develops inside it so it looks something like this right now this is the lumen right 
So this is the lumen that eventually ends up connecting the amniotic cavity to the yolk sac. And this is known as the neuroenteric canal. I don't know if you've understood this, so I'm going to say it once again. This is the notochordal process, okay? It got canalized. Where did the canal come from? It is nothing but the continuation of the primitive pit. So if you're looking from up, the primitive pit was connecting to the amniotic cavity above, correct? Over here, amniotic cavity above. And this lumen keeps going through and through. You can see it over here. You can see literally see the lumen over here. The lumen goes through and through and ends up connecting with this part. That is the yolk sac. Hence, it is known as the neuroenteric canal connecting the amniotic cavity to the yolk sac. But soon, the floor region of this canal gets intercalated with the endoderm. So you can see that happening over here. This black thing is kind of getting mixed up with the endodermal cells. You can see that it gets intercalated with the endodermal cells. And again, after some time, they go back and form a solid cord. Now don't ask me why they go through all these stages, but what you finally have is what is known as the definitive notochord to be differentiated from the notochordal process or the primitive notochord, which occurs in the early stages, right? So the notochord goes through the following stages, the notochordal process, then canalization through the primitive pit, which forms the neuroenteric canal since the canal opens down into the yolk sac. Then the floor of this intercalates with the endoderm but after some time it rolls up again and forms what is known as the definitive notochord which you see here. That is the journey of the notochord and you'll ask me why are we learning all this? That is because once the notochord is formed it establishes the midline of the body. Okay, we already knew which was the caudal end because where the primitive streak arises is the future caudal end of the embryo. That's somewhere over here. And now we've got a beautiful midline that is separating the left and the right half of the embryo. Right? Since we're looking from the ectodermal side, this is the left and the right half of the embryo. Now there are certain molecular mechanisms operating predominantly here. Certain molecular mechanisms operating predominantly here. And the notochord becomes an important inducer to ensure that the right kind of activities are happening on either side. So if you've got a problem with the notochord because of teratogenic insult, then you have what are known as laterality defects. Example of that is dextrocardia where the heart is on the right side instead of the left or another condition known as situs inversus where everything is inverted. So these are very interesting things that we're going to study later in systemic embryology. But remember that the failure of the notochord to arise or the failure of the notochord to do its job of induction properly leads to what are known as laterality defects. Okay, the notochord eventually regresses by about day 21. It's already begun regression by about day 26. The notochord completely disappears and remains in the adult axial skeleton in the vertebrae or the body of the vertebra and it remains as what is known as nucleus pulposus. This is an important MCQ. I want you to remember it for the rest of your life. The notochord starts regressing at 21 days, completely disappears by 26 days and its remnants persist in the body of the vertebra, in the body of the vertebra as the nucleus pulposus somewhere over here. The nucleus pulposus. That's the only remnant of the uh, notochord in adults. But in case of really primitive animals like amphioxus, it does persist as a proper midline of their body. Okay. By the way, this is where the word chordata comes from. Phylum chordata. Chordata. Okay. So the last thing we're going to learn is what is the allantoic diverticulum well you know what the connective stock is i've already told you so a part of the endoderm invaginates inside the connecting stock and that is known as the allantoic diverticulum in lower animals like birds this is used to store waste products but in human beings it's just an embryological remnant which is of significance 
when we speak about abnormalities of the bladder okay congenital anomalies of the bladder so allantoic diverticulum is important when we do our lecture on the genitourinary system okay so that's what i would like to talk about the allantois for now to summarize everything first at day 15 you have what is known as the primitive streak you can see the primitive node over here you can see the detaching cells over here losing their adhesion and then they are going to migrate how are they going to migrate well they are going to migrate from a caudal to a cephalic direction and when they migrate their fate is already being sealed which we shall study again later in embryogenesis sorry in organogenesis and the only places where they can't really squeeze in between are the procaudal plate and the cloacal membrane the procaudal plate eventually forms the buccopharyngeal membrane okay some textbooks mention the procaudal plate as the region just caudal to the buccopharyngeal membrane okay different authors different views but eventually you can assume both of these to be the same thing so this point and this point is where the intraembryonic mesoderm does not invaginate okay the buccopharyngeal membrane eventually will form the oral cavity and the cloacal membrane will eventually be responsible for the anal membrane and then the anal cavity we'll study about all that soon okay this is what an embryo looks like at day 16 and this is what an embryo looks like at day 19 what you see is the neural plate which we discussed and the primitive streak and eventually we are now going to study which germ layer gives rise to which organs etc etc so i'll see you in the next lecture that is organogenesis and after a discussion on a basic discussion on all these things then we are going to move towards the placenta. Thank you so much for listening and things are now really on track. So you need to start reading these things because they're absolutely interesting. See you in the next one. Bye-bye.